Welcome all to this um, session. It's still theme one uh, and the first theme is about distance teaching and learning. Uh, new challenges for teacher education policy and practice. And it's the fifth session in within this theme. Uh, my name is Erika Lövström. Um, I'm from the University of Helsinki, professor of education there and a long-term member of uh, the Tepe network. Uh, so welcome all, and I hope you, you will enjoy this uh, session. Um, unfortunately, we have uh, one cancellation, and it's the second paper by Monica Geiser. Uh, she was uh, unfortunately um, forced to, to cancel her participation. Uh, so only two papers, but uh, we concluded that we'll um, we'll proceed with in scheduled according to the schedule. So the presenters have a maximum of twenty minutes for their presentations. After which we can take a few questions. Uh, and um, I was thinking that maybe at that point we can ask uh, questions that are specific to those pre to that presentation. So if you want clarifications or or it's more uh, detailed question related to, to to some of the content in the presentation, we could take that sort of questions right away. But if you have more broader uh, thoughts and, and, and questions around uh, implications for teacher education policy and practice, maybe we could take those kind of uh, questions and comments after the two presentations. Um, okay, so, um, and yes, we, um, I suggest that um, uh, we use the uh, raise hand uh, function for uh, asking for for the floor. Um, I think this is probably the easiest. Although we are not so many, but um, people might pop in, so so maybe it's easier to handle the the raise hand function. Um, all right, um, and with me here I have also Igor uh, from uh, Ljubljana. Uh, who is um, the backup and uh, making sure that uh, everything works fine. Good. Okay. All right then, so I, I will start by giving the floor to uh, Niklas Balskill, uh, who is presenting a paper titled When Pedagogical Times Stopped a Temporal View of the Pandemic. Uh, and uh, this is a presentation um, that Nicholas uh, does together with Anders Norberg, but I believe Nicholas is, will be the presenter. So please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so um, this is a, a presentation really reflecting on the pandemic and the impact really on a moment, a rare moment perhaps, when a particular form of pedagogy stopped, effectively stopped, uh, that is the school-based uh, pedagogy. And Nicholas, sorry to interrupt, do you want to put your presentation uh, into the presentation mode? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Um... Yeah, right there. There, how's that? Right. I won't frighten you with uh, the, the, the sight of like 200 slides to go or something like that, you know. Um, so, yeah, so it's just a, a really, a, I thought it was a, a, a rather we thought, uh, and Anders and myself thought it was partic a, a particularly interesting time to just think about this rare moment in the world when a particular form of pedagogy stopped, uh, you know, and what were the implications of, of that? What, what, what could that mean um, for a pedagogical time to stop? And this is just one particular take that is a way of bridging 
into a conversation about uh, cultural landscapes in the internet and the relationship between physical and digital, these kinds of things. And I've, I've changed the title slightly uh, from a process of socialization to one of interculturation might be the implicit consequence of the pedagogical time having stopped. So Anders and I have been talking quite a bit over a number of over a year or so now about the idea of time in pedagogy and the idea of space, different times, different spaces in, in pedagogy relative to technology and learning. And, and I think one thing that we definitely both share is this sense that it no longer seems to make sense to talk about being offline. In other words, we are so much with our mobile phones and so much with technology that the in, there may be intervals between that are often momentary. And so it's, it's very interesting to think about that idea of it being effectively these modes being merged. But I'm saying also that both remain, the physical and the digital still remain. And so too does the cognitive aspect still remain. Um, albeit in, in, in a, a mix, as it were. And that you can think about when we're designing learning, we can think about weaving the physical and digital, and we can think about weaving time together and time apart. But I think also it's an opportunity to think about cultures and interacting cultural moments uh, of engagement and what that means in those moments, in those episodes of engagement. So we can think about the organization of learning and teaching, particularly digitally, um, in, in terms of synchronous and asynchronous. That's one way of organizing our interaction together. But what I'm suggesting is that we can also think about the continuity of a culture and the discontinuity of a culture in episodes of time, non-linear, and that that might also relate then to synchronous and asynchronous and so on. We also have this idea with the advent of technology of globalized education and a conversation between local and global. And I'm suggesting, or I'd like to suggest, that particularly when pedagogical time stopped for the school, but a place-based idea of education, that we can think about the local and class as psychological entities, regardless of digital or physicality. Um, but also that we can think about the local and global, not as a constant, but particularly as psychological entities, both fluid and relational in different situations. So that's kind of the contents of my talk, as it were. And by all means, if you want to ask, interrupt and ask any questions at any time, you're welcome to do so. But that's kind of the, the, the setting. And so I just say a little bit, perhaps, about one conception. It, it, it is a little bit uh, generalized. Before pedagogical time stopped, before the pandemic, if you like. And one is to think about schools uh, as technologies. This is something that Anders talked about this morning uh, as well. But schools that are schools are really um, 
te physical technologies. Um, so if you uh, went down the street wherever you are currently located and went to a school there that, that was near to you, it probably would be recognizable to anybody else anywhere else. You know, in other words, this has become a global technology. It's a it's kind of a design. The, the design of a school is pretty much the same around the world, allowing for different size and different materials. You would probably recognize that architecture wherever you went. And in that sense, it's a physical uh, technology. It's a pedagogical technology for the, for the way in which the shapes of the rooms and the use of the rooms constrains the learning and teaching that can happen within it. And I'm also arguing it's a cultural technology. It's a place that makes these values um, privileged, if you like, or salient, and it makes other cultures potentially um, unwelcome or potentially um, more problematic, shall we say. Uh, but school is a culture or it's part of the culture of education. And I would say that uh, particularly before the pandemic, schools could be seen as local. They're obviously physically local. They're, they've got their own timetables, they're temporarily local. And I'd say they're digitally local as well because most of the use of technology in schools is to present information to other people in the building, in that same building. It's not always the case, but that's a kind of broad summary, if you like, of pre-pandemic life in the school, in the place-based school. And just this point again, that schools engage with uh, family cultures uh, and that, that education is a process of socialization from one culture into another, that of the school. And that um, families are recruited, if you like, to support that process of assimilation into that culture. And it's interesting that Brufi defines learning, defines education as a process of re-socialization. It's almost this kind of we're, we're going to reprogram you or something like that, you know. So it's kind of that re just so it's a very striking term to me, this idea that we're going to re-socialize you uh, into the discipline into the school, into education. So just to uh, highlight that cultural dimension. So then of course the pandemic hit and schools and families, I'm, I'm using schools and families as, as two uh, ways of modeling this intercultural or uh, this dialogue the relationship between cultures. But schools and families then became displaced. In other words, they left the school site, the physical site. Or if you like, they became replaced. They became replaced in the home. So education then became located in the home. And this was true of uh, all the staff it's true of the teachers and of, of, of the children or students, or whatever sector you like to think about. But education became re recited, replaced uh, in the home. And of course, the technology is then used to organize work and negotiate how that will happen such that I'm arguing that the school is no longer a reference to a physical um, entity. It's a reference to a psychological entity, a psychological group in our minds. And then being in class, when I'm in class, 
is a moment of engagement with that particular psychological entity. Uh, and once we're online, of course, um, we're then moving between these different psychological entities, albeit that there may be um, related online spaces for each one. And Hargreaves before talked about, uh, he, he said that teachers will in the future exist within a moving mosaic of projects. And I would say as well, cultures that we, we will be, because the modes of teaching and learning and, and technology and not technology are so merged and that this has been highlighted perhaps in the pandemic, that we are all effectively existing in this moving mosaic of intercultural, if you like, but particularly, I'm going to say, in a process of not so much intercultural, but interculturation, where your own culture is continued, but negotiating uh, in interactions with other cultures. And we tend to think about the internet as this kind of, uh, there, there is a kind of a sense of local and global, but otherwise it's largely quite undifferentiated in our, in our minds. Or, or for, for many people, it's just, I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna go to this website and I'm gonna get this information that I need, or I'm gonna go to this site and do this Zoom call or whatever it is. But it, it can seem very in, uh, undifferentiated. And so I thought it'd be quite interesting to look at uh, Alex Haslam's work and uh, in social psychology and his uh, levels of self-abstraction. And so he says that at any moment in time, we can think of ourselves differently, either as individuals or as members of a small team, members of a department or members of an organization. And these are like cognitive switches. Uh, and when one particular switch is on, we have that is populated differently compared with when another cognitive switch is on. So in other words, when, when the department level is on, uh, the team level is switched off and the department is populated with a different cross section of the total population. And the reason I'm saying this is that this applies equally to the digital space as it does to the physical space. So in other words, it, the, the Internet is all this stuff out there, just like the physical world. When you leave your house or you close your front door, the physical world is the same. There's this whole world out there, but how are you going to engage with it? Well, you, one of the ways that you engage with it is um, with a particular group in your mind, with the norms and values associated with that group while it's active in your mind. And that shapes your engagement, either with the physical world or the digital world. Okay, so that's just one way you could think about it. But it helps us then, I think, to think about this, not as just a um, websites on our laptop, but rather to think about it as uh, moments of differentiation in the social space that shape our interaction. And so this is why I'm proposing that local and global are um, not no longer this physical school building and then everything outside the school building as kind of local and global in a fixed way. But once that the, the, uh, the in being in school is uh, a, a, a psychological group, um, then when that's active, everything outside is global, whether it's online or physically that you're located. So, for instance, uh, I could be in a Zoom call with my class, with my module group, 
or whatever. And at that moment, everything outside is global and inside is local. And then I come into this uh, conference and this group. And for now, I'm arguing that this is my local and that everything outside this conference, including my class, is global. And so that I'm, I'm saying that it's, it's situational, it's relational, the local and global, it's fluid, it's not a, a constant um, based on this kind of thinking. Boulanger talks about this idea of discontinuity and continuity in interaction between cultures. So for instance, uh, the interaction in, in school, if uh, it can be this, this, this idea that my family values are discontinued in order to come into the school and inhabit that culture. But where family values are respected, it could be that rather than covering your curriculum, as it were, uh, and, and in your domain, that, that we might negotiate and work from that process uh, as a way forward. And in that sense, there's a moment of discontinuity and continuity that both are perhaps suspended in that interaction or that both are continuous in that interaction, depending on how you frame it. And so this kind of pre-pandemic and post-pandemic view I'm suggesting is potentially a journey from socialization to interculturation. So socialization is the assimilation of one culture into the other, where one is discontinued and the other might be continued. Knowledge is determined then in what's called additive epistemology. In other words, it's a linear progression that I cover the curriculum you've set uh, in the negation of my um, culture, if you like. And you could say that that involves a zone of proximal development. Uh, the, the purpose of that zone is for me to be carried further than I could on my own into that culture. That's a particular reading of it, if you like. But the interculturation is uh, this meeting of two cultures in, in a particular moment. And the pedagogical challenge then is to create these spaces in, in which interculturation can happen, where both cultures or all cultures are admitted and, and have equal status. Boulanger and de Bono talk about the zone of interculturation as, as the gap, um, the space in which the gap uh, can be explored together and new knowledge can be created. And this is non-additive uh, epistemology. The idea that it's not just a linear accumulation of whatever you've set out for me, but rather that it's negotiable and that we'll explore that together in this interaction. So the, the, the last slide here is this idea of uh, a practice of interculturation. So I've tried to think about all of that. What, what you know, how would that look? What could it mean for practice? And one um, way of doing it or thinking about it is that we work rather on the basis of individualization, uh, which is not to negate that, but to say we might work as a whole group of uh, contributing cultures. And that the goal is no longer consensus. The goal is maximizing diversity and that, that creates a resource for the group to work individually and collectively to make meaning out of that in this exchange in this moment of exchange uh, 
And Ulahal and Danu talk about the key then to look at these traces of intercultural interaction uh, as the goal, partly from autobiographical memory, but I would also say from collective memory as well. So that, um, you know, you might retrace these uh, archives in particular ways as part of the pedagogy of interculturation. So, <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, and um, I believe we do have Anders, yes, here as well. So um, do we have any questions uh, to Nicholas and Anders at, at this point? Uh, Mario, please. Yes, thank you for the very thought-giving presentation. Uh, I thought about this um, when you, you had this, uh, the, the pedagogical time stopped. So would you like to elaborate on it? Uh, so, so why, why did it stop? <laughs> so if it was uh, replaced, and I, I thought about this, um, I very much um, agree with you that the situation of global and local is fluent. And now we are present, we, we are sharing the digital space, but then, then um, and, and the pandemic made it um, that, that you have to do it in schools and maybe it was new for the schools, but for instance, for the university for a hundred years, I, I think the professors were working in their homes and uh, uh, already before the pandemics, if you had the youth had board games, now they have these digital same games that they can um, play with people who are kind of uh, not present in the physical space, but but the digital space. But but this um, this uh, idea of this stopping of this pedagogical. Uh, mm. Well, I think, I mean, it is, it, it's uh, something that I'm only, uh, the, the, the Anders and I are exploring and still trying to make some sense of ourselves, I think, uh, as everybody is, you know, this, this whole uh, thing. But I mean, one, one thing that's sort of very striking perhaps is, is that uh, we, we changed location and that caused the process to uh, be negotiable at least in terms of how we would organize ourselves now versus before. And also, you know, what the significance of this global event, if we can call it an event, you know, this global moment is uh, for, for the school and its local participants being repositioned mm -hmm. in a global yeah. space rather yeah. than the consciousness of being very local, uh, we're suddenly very much more aware of, of not just being, um, you know, part, we're part of the, this ecology, you know, this um, ecological space as well and time. So, uh, the, the, you know, I, I don't think we know uh, the answer to your question <laughs> is, is the short, uh, short answer, but it's kind of just a, an interesting thing to wonder about, perhaps. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yes, it, it, yes. One a small a comment from me as co-author, if possible here. Well, before I think that, that universities and other educational providers that had so-called online education they th thought that uh, this was uh, unproblematic the students are now online we don't have to book any rooms for them and that's unproblematic but but it showed that i uh, know that the students were somewhere and they had to have equipment and communication and a, a quiet quiet area 
in the home if the home was large enough, etc. Local spaces are very, very important from for studies and for study results and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, I think this is really interesting um, that um, what you just uh, said and, and uh, how um, distance education, although I noted that we shouldn't maybe talk about the distance education anymore, but it has been maybe distance education before and, uh, and there have been those others or, or it has co concerned maybe some group of people who, who engage in such activities and now we are somehow collectively uh, more or less uh, uh, part of, of what's, what's going on, on at, at the moment and um, so uh, it also puts, puts a different spin on, on the terminology and, and, and how we, how we like and maybe should talk about it and what concepts uh, uh, are maybe not so suitable to today. But I'm thinking about the last uh, uh, slide in, in Nicholas' presentation about the collective memory and, and, uh, and in, a, in a way we are all the time uh, like the, these examples of, of the studies that we're talking about today and, and tomorrow in, in the TEPE conference show that we are already somehow uh, investigating and analyzing the collective memory uh, while we are cons constructing these memories or while they are, are being constructed. And, and it, it's sort of interesting in terms of time for me to think about how how we construct uh, what's happening right now collectively and how we might be reflecting later on, let's say in a few years time. Uh, and probably there will be a million different recollections. Uh, most people will probably agree that something happened, uh, but then those interpretations, uh, what happened and and what were the connotations that that went with it uh, that, that that might differ but uh, so um, well, I, it's, it's would you really, like to elaborate more on, on, on that part of collective yes, memory it, yeah that, that it's really interesting in in, 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 in different ways actually uh, what you're saying there because um, I did some research interviews not long ago with uh, various teachers who've been through the pandemic and so on one of them uh, that comes to mind talked about uh, all this digital material that was generated in the school by the teachers and by the students, by the kids, you know, there's the, um, and they said, well, it's, it's really good in one sense, because when we return to any normality, we've got all this um, resource now, all these lectures, uh, all these lectures that the teachers pr produced will be reused uh, to support classroom uh, teaching. So they're drawing on that. Uh, and one of the interesting things that I'm trying to write about now, almost as a kind of um, outcome of that, uh, I found in, in a few of the interviews I did about 25 interviews for this particular piece of work, was a reference to nostalgia. And it is uh, really interesting because you would never imagine something so horrific as um, a pandemic, as having any relationship to nostalgia, perhaps nostalgia for the time before the pandemic, but these teachers were talking about nostalgia for the pandemic, for the educational crisis itself. And when I asked them, well, what do you mean by what, what's, what's good about that, that you'd want to look fondly back on it? And they said never had they been so together as a school 
in trying to address this uh, challenge of the pandemic, it had caused such bonding and such collegiality that was it partly old time collegiality that they'd heard about of, of you know, around the water cooler or whatever they, they talk about, that they used to have in staff rooms uh, and, and so on, uh, that doesn't exist now uh, very often. Um, but they'd been forced throughout this to work out a response together to this pandemic that for which was completely unforeseeable to them and for which they were all unprepared and that they'd been through a war together effectively, trying to teach um, and care for each other through, and uh, you know, the, each other, every member of the school, the children and the teachers and each other um, through this pandemic. And the, the consequence was that they developed nostalgia for an educational crisis. Uh, and, and this is, I'm just trying to write this at the moment, um, but, but that, the collective memory, that, so, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an answer to your point about collective, collective memory, that this, this collective memory will invoke uh, and has already invoked nostalgia as one response. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I can see um, that uh, the, the experience of being in this together, collaboratively trying to solve <laughs> this, this massive problem creates a, 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 a sense of, uh, of, of, of uh, nostalgia and, and uh, that maybe also some kind of togetherness in, exactly in that, that exactly uh, experience. Yeah. The, 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 to get uh, nostalgia is a product of uh, belonging and uh, psychological belonging and and when your group is made so um, concrete uh, mentally concrete as the whole world is coming in on you and the parents and families are coming at you for uh, responses and so on this group of teachers were then really conscious of themselves as a group even though they were individually in their own houses, uh, such that it invoked a sense of group belonging, which then gave rise to um, nostalgia uh, as the affective output of it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what an interesting paper and interesting discussion. Um, speaking of time, I, I I uh, guess we need to move on to the next presentation. For those of you who popped in late, uh, later, uh, for your information, the second paper is cancelled, so don't worry about the time. Um, mm, uh, unfortunately, Monica Geiser had to cancel her presentation uh, this morning. But let's move on to uh, uh, the third paper, uh, Martes Piteri. Filippo Nano, Colleen Kaleha, Hannele Niemi, and Sirku Mannik Bar Barbutiu. And I believe that Martes is uh, here to uh, present the paper. Please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sorry, sorry, my screen. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Nicholas, um, in fact, this collaboration was also felt in, in my research here. I um, This is a work in progress and uh, I am um, still collecting data from the, the parents and the students. And here I'm going to present some data from the teachers in the, in the classroom with multicultural students. So drawing from a larger study, this presentation investigates the teacher's dispositions to meet the challenges of online learning in multicultural classrooms during the COVID pandemic. Um, due, to the, due to the current pandemic, multi schools were closed between March and June, 2020. And um, the research question, 
was uh, how were Maltese teachers dispositions to meet the challenges of online learning in what culture classrooms during the COVID pandemic manifested. And to investigate the research, the teacher's dispositions, two main dispositions were um, considered the digital dispositions and the multicultural dispositions. Now, this is why dispositions and digital dispositions um, are mainly made up of self efficacy. The teachers believe in her capacity to perform an activity, the teacher's attitude, whether the teacher find it essential and beneficial, the teacher's pedagogical beliefs about how they should teach and how students learn, and the teacher's willingness to change through openness to change. The multicultural dispositions were um, highlighted through the teacher's empathy, her or his ability to under the, understand the class from the um, student's perspective. Meekness, the teacher tries to seek out new opportunities, even uncomfortable ones. Uh, social awareness, the teacher's awareness of one's own beliefs and attitudes and being able to think critically about them. Inclusion, the teachers value the students' differences and makes them explicit and advocacy. The teacher tries to discover opportunities to advocate for the underprivileged students. So data for this research was collect collected through online individual interviews with 21 primary class teachers teaching in areas with high foreign population and more. And to answer the research question, the interview transcripts were read and after coding, three main teams were chosen. And sorry, four main challenges were identified. The new teaching approaches, the home environment, the communication and the training. So um, the teacher's digital disposition towards the challenge of new teaching approaches was um, shown when teachers downloaded various resources and helped them to adapt the lessons to diverse students' needs. They felt that with time, their self-efficacy was enhanced and they noticed that improvement was influenced by the students and the parents' self-efficacy. They found that online teaching was essential, but the students missed the hands-on activities and the interactions. Teachers believe that students learn best when they interact because they can explain to each other better. And they applied differentiated pedagogical approaches to reach the students' individual needs. And the teachers' willingness to adopt and change their teaching approaches um, were shown when they took initiative by first giving some online handouts and then gradually moving to online teaching um, through MS Teams. The teachers noticed that he was using this particular teaching was teacher was using technology more and that teaching online was very individualistic. Um, he realized that he wished he knew how to use technology for, for group work because he missed the group work activities, but with his limited knowledge and resources adapted to deliver online lessons. The teacher's multicultural dispositions towards the challenge of new teaching approaches was shown in the teacher's empathy during online sessions. Some st students did not understand Maltese or English and because they were foreign students. So they had no, some of them had no support at home. And as a solution, this teacher first explained the lesson in Maltese and then in English. Sorry, um, this, these students could not understand Maltese, not English. Uh, teachers showed meekness by introducing the students through a class video. Uh, this teacher suggested that each student will produce a, a short video clip of themselves saying something in their native language and uh, introduce their home country. Then the teacher merged all video clips and uh, into one whole. Teacher realized that not everyone had the internet connection, so she made use of a printed material. 
those who but those who had the internet and participated the teacher used um, different apps like the j2e and the beside yes the ms team so they use different apps however um another teacher noticed that some migrant parents were not aware of these apps and to include everyone during the online lesson um they prepared other material so advocacy was shown by these teachers through their participating in this research, and some of them were doing research themselves in this area during the pandemic. And um, the teacher digital disposition storage challenge of the home environment was shown that it was um, less easy to use when the student's camera was switched off. Also, parents were at loss on how to use technology. And most of them said, we can't do this online, this, these lessons. The, another teacher stated that although technology was beneficial during the pandemic, it was challenging for them to make some students use the tablets, for example, because of the other technology they had at home, like the PlayStation. Another teacher found opposing attitudes from the parents, whether their child should participate or not. Some stated that it was the responsibility of the student whether to, to join the online sessions. Another um, teacher had the pedagogical belief that in order for students to thrive during the online lessons, parents should be present and support their children. However, um, another teacher realized that it was difficult for parents to support their children because some could not speak or understand the languages. And also some parents did not know how to use technology. And it, it was the children who taught them how to use certain programs. So the teachers' dig digital dispositions were shown in their willingness to change from traditional teaching methods to online. Another teacher felt the responsibility to continue communicating with the students because not all came from a positive background. And another teacher tried to find other ways of delivering the lessons when the teacher, when the students were not online. The teacher's multicultural disposition towards the home environment um, depended on the socioeconomic background. In well off areas, parents supported their children. However, in families where the parents had to work long hours, students were left alone. They, uh, t another teacher realized that although digital resources were available, um, however, they were shared by a greater number of children in, in families with a lot of children. And also girls had greater responsibilities than boys where they had to take care of their siblings when their parents were at work and do the housework. And another teacher found that through parental involvement, for example, in the J2E, he could understand the, the student's background. And he knew that parents played an important role and this teacher approach was to pace her instruction and to check whether everyone had understood. During the process, realized that parents were also helping one another. And when, uh, when possible, she, this teacher um, also provided handwritten notes and little notes of instruction on how to use the MS Teams, for example. The teacher disposition stores inclusion um, realized that the main problem was not related to the parents' origin, but to the language barrier. And another teacher applied various inclusive um, methods, for example, sending emails because parents used more um, emails or messages, SMSs, and uh, organizing video calls. Um, another teacher made use of an interpreter, and another made use of a migrant teacher, which was available at, in schools. So advocacy as well um, was um, shown through the teacher's interest in participating in this research. The teacher digital disposition stores the challenge of communication was it shown, for example, when a teacher tried to communicate with parents online through, 
MS Teams, but she received no feedback. Then she posted on the school Facebook page and she received more response because everybody used Facebook. Um, this, these teachers wished to communicate with these parents. They found it difficult to, to communicate with migrant parents. They realized that new skills were required for the students to be able to communicate. For example, they had to teach them how to open an email. And um, the teachers were willing to change her, um, their practices. However, it was challenging for them because parents were not um, collaborating. For example, during Parents Day, which was online, some did not even book a time. And the teachers, the multicultural dispositions towards the challenge of communication was shown when um, the teacher tried to understand the students' conditions. For some parents, it was difficult to communicate in English and Maltese, and some had no internet. So as a solution, another teacher was to encourage the student to accept, act as mediators, as interpreters, for example, during the parents' day, and also encourage them to help their siblings to um, translate. The, another teacher stated that it was challenging for teachers since they were still learning how to use the new equipment. Programs and at the same time, they were expected to teach the skills to both the students and the parents. They realized that although a lot of information was inf available, some parents were technologically illiterate, found it difficult to reach the experience. And uh, although different levels of involvement, also this, this parent and teacher noticed different levels of involvement between the, the mothers and the fathers. In some um, cultures, in some families, it was always the father who communicated with technology. Um, the, the, this teacher was aware that some students had no support at home and some not even the internet. So this teacher used to call them instead. So the digital dispositions towards the challenge of training was shown. Teachers said it was very intensive and overwhelming. It was a difficult process because everyone had the same difficulties and no support. And again, parents did not know from where to start. And the attitude toward training was that it required a lot of self-teaching through trial and error. And and felt that um, some students and parents did not try hard enough. Teachers realized that new skills were required, for example, for the students to remember their passwords and to remember how to log in. Some teachers found online teaching difficult, but then they, they adapted. They sometimes uh, and admitted that sometimes they learned from the students. But still, teachers uh, still experience certain resistance from the students and parents to use technology. And this particular teacher couldn't understand why they knew how to use their Facebooks, but then found it difficult to use the tablet. And uh, the last, the teacher's multicultural dispositions towards the challenge of training was realized that not, um, when the teacher realized that not every one grabs the new skills with the same way, in the same way. For example, that she noticed that one child you give her a tablet and she tells you how to use it. While on the other hand, the child asks you whether it's okay to press a button. And we must um, understand that for some students, it was the first time that they were using technology. And meekness was shown when teachers tried to convince a, stu a student mother to contact the school for support on how to use the MS Teams. And another teacher um, tried to introduce the MS Teams to the parents by starting from what they already knew. So through emails, which was something they knew how to use, and she explained Teams by sending emails. But another teacher stated that some parents showed complete rejection in trying and realized that parents lacked the very basic knowledge and skills 
to support their children. And to include, for inclusion, to introduce all parents to MS teams, another teacher created a Facebook group because it was something that everyone was familiar with. So as recommendations, I, I am still in the process of, of analyzing this. Just a few comments. Maybe teacher training should be ongoing. Prepare all students in self-directed learning. Develop parental dig digital skills and support and encourage more teachers, teacher involvement in, in research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martias, um, um, for your presentation. Um, do we have questions to, to Martias at this um, moment? Yes, please, Nicolas. Well, I thought that was a great presentation and there were a lot of things that came out of that for me. Um, but, but just sort of a one, one question would be, um, dispositions towards the profession, uh, the teaching profession, uh, on the part of the parents, did they change? One of the things that I've become aware of is parents have become much more aware of the complexity of teaching uh, and the, the job that teachers do because it's been, they've been joined into the process in a way that they've never previously necessarily been required to do so that that's one question and just a, a, an observation the gendered view of technology as being uh, the, the the male domain as it were in the stereotypical idea meeting the gendered uh, the gendered view of education as a the other stereotype uh, as being perhaps female in the stereotype and so perhaps more than anything did this bring together a clash of, well, whose, whose domain are we in here? Is this uh, interculturation in a sense that needs to happen that, you know, once we're in a technologized educational realm, those previous stereotypes become even more problematic, don't they, you know? Yes, there seems to be a, a clash between these stereotypes even from the teacher's perspective, um, they don't understand why some parents behave that way because they come from different uh, backgrounds. And um, so I, I'm tr st still trying to um, see this thing. And the first question I did it. Um, uh, just whether the, uh, if you like, the you, your talk was about dispositions. And, and sort of attitudes or perceptions from the parents held yeah. by parents of teachers, did it change over, over it, it, as a it, consequence? But it was very difficult for, um, for migrant um, parents. They seem to be lost. Um, most, most students did not continue with the lessons and they could not contact the parents most of the time, it was very difficult, even by phone. Mm -hmm. So something must be done to continue so the, the education for all children, not only for the locals. So I, I don't think um, there were uh, that uh, much emphasis on the migrant parents' dispositions to participate. Most of the time I felt that they were not aware what is going on, like that they have certain um, responsibilities for the children to share their their in the education of their children with with the with the teacher that things have changed during the COVID that now it's not only the the teacher who delivers the lesson but they must participate as well. Mm. I could imagine it making them either angry or raising the esteem of teachers because they were doing such difficult jobs. Uh, you know, an, an awareness of them doing difficult jobs or angry in the sense of, isn't this your job and why have I got it? This kind of thing. Yes, and it was overwhelming for the for the teachers to reach um, the locals. And it was like the, the others were lost. They could not reach them and maybe they had no 
not enough time, not enough resources, not enough knowledge how to do it. A lot of things, like no support. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should work more um, and provide more for these students, for these underprivileged ones. I think this also ties very much um, uh, to uh, Professor Apple's um, keynote yes. uh, yesterday, uh, both this uh, gendered aspect, but also uh, the appreciation or uh, how the teacher's work is understood and, and by, by parents and, and do they see it, the teacher's work and the role of school and class in, in a different way. Uh, light uh, and and if so how how does that change and uh, uh, so so very much tied to also yesterday's um, um, keynote but Björn has uh, asked for for the floor so please go ahead thank you thank you for um, I think two very interesting papers and rather different type of papers uh, uh, one uh, theoretically oriented and one very empirically oriented which i found very interesting uh, to listen to in, in during the the same the same session and uh, and uh, i was sort of thinking about uh, asking you to comment each other's papers from that perspective. But Nicholas has, has already sort of embarked on that. Uh, so my question would be to something like, um, in, fr from one perspective, I understand that education is always about some kind of cultural meeting which you have described differently now from different angles and i would be interested in hearing from martese uh, how you how you what what's your interpretation of of the perspective that nicolas and anders had put forward as as this change as a move from socialization to an intercultural a process. What what would your um, reflections be on that? I think um, it it's, takes a lot of reflection. If I am a teach from my position as a teacher or a migrant parent, which one do you prefer? Because I'm both. <laughs> okay, as a teacher. Well, it, it takes a lot of um, reflection from the part of the teacher to understand the, the students, not only um, because she needs, he or she needs to understand what is going on in the lives of the students. For example, what comes to mind is this migrant girl who at home, she will have to take care of her siblings. And at the same time, there might be one computer which is being shared between a number of siblings, maybe six or five. And then at the same time, she will have to cook and clean the home. So to understand what it means for her, the meanings, the culture of that girl and the, the situation in class, if we go back to, to a normal classroom, then it, um, it gives a lot of light to the teacher because she starts understanding, she understands more what um, the situation of that girl, for example, in preparing lessons for her and to make it more relevant. For example, she might understand more why the child never brings her homework at school or or, or the, so the situation for her, the, the concepts used at school might not apply. I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm understanding well, but. Um, yes, I think, I think that was an insightful comment about that to, to what kind of level this is about. And uh, somewhere here, I guess we have in this meeting between cultures, that's also the 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 sort of the the place, the potential space for learning to occur from both sides, more or less. Yes, both 
the mm-hmm. teacher learning from the student and the student learning from the teacher, but also the parents played an important role. Mm-hmm. I, I think that was missing before. Now the teachers, the parents know more what, how much work the teacher needs. For example, most of the time the, the tablet was in the, placed in the kitchen and the parents were at the background. And teachers said, um, some parents told me how, how nice was the lesson, I enjoyed your lesson. So they were interacting with, as well in a way, those who were present, because not every, every parent was present. Yes, thank you. Chair, may I ask a second question? Uh, yes, go ahead. I'm seeing that there may be somebody new here. So just in case you didn't hear yet, the second paper was cancelled. So we moved on in, in a slightly different schedule here. But uh, please, Björn, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I, I was thinking about when you, Nicholas, were talking about nostalgia um, and the sense that teachers had had that during in this um, challenging situation, they come together and they work together and they they felt like an uh, old time when they were a more more of a collegiate a- approach. I, I was in fact thinking about um, you know some comment from UK. Uh, the experience under the Second World War, for example. And I've been thinking about that as it's, there is something in here when, when we think about agency theory, that when, when professionals own the kind of the agenda, they come together and they, and they could solve problem because they have set the agenda but here it's the kind of opposite situation that there is kind of an earthquake or something. Something is happening which no one wanted to happen, but suddenly they come together. What's your thought about that as a as a kind of a challenge to how we understand how professionals works in in as a as a collective group? Yeah, I think that's that's right. That, 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 I mean, I did mention to one of them: is it is it um, uh, coming through a war? They, they, they sort of said, well, I can see the similarity, uh, but we, we just feel it was a time when we, everybody had the outlook of helping each other, that nobody was thinking about them. One, one teacher in one interview said, I knew that somebody was there to help me. I didn't want to... Um, send too many emails to my colleagues because I was aware of the stress and pressure they were under in the same way that I am under the stress and pressure and that I didn't want to add to that with asking more questions. What they did then amongst themselves is to create an online space into which they each put uh, things that worked, ideas, for help and training materials as well for those ideas. And the idea, this, this idea of diversity, not consensus as an approach to professional development and learning, that these, these ideas were pooled from the teachers as a group into an online space. And then any individual might then uh, overview the set of ideas and see which one might have relevance for them personally in that particular moment uh, as, as an idea of both mutual support and avoidance of additional stress and I think one thing that comes out of it as well as nostalgia perhaps and as well as agency in that kind of uh, mutually supportive activity is this issue of resilience. Resilience was something that was not there before and that they are aware is still not there, but they are aware now that one of the biggest responses they need to develop as a consequence of this, whatever it looks like, is resilience. Resilience as a school 
resilience individually, resilience for the kids and resilience for the parents and families. And part of that is things like putting in um, a digital platform, a VLE or something like that, perhaps. So, uh, and part of it is putting digital materials into that space so that if the crisis or another crisis recurred, they would have some kind of resilience and response by having that infrastructure there ready for going home again or whatever it was. But that just generally this mutuality of uh, uh, professional development and this mutuality of disposition, if you like, to talk about dispositions is central and vital for resilience and, and that resilience uh, and nostalgia and these kinds of affective issues are actually as important as any practical response to it. Or, or a part of the practical response. Yes, I think that's very, very interesting to, to listen to and to think about because uh, there are some aspects here of how people behaved, which is like a kind of, um, you know, something where, where, which usually are sought after in leadership, sort of what can you do to have people come together to this mutuality to pay attention to each other, be supportive and all those kind of things. And we would like to, to know how to create such situations without catastrophes, so to say. Hmm. One of the models of leadership that's uh, emerged from, from Haslam's work particularly is the concept of leadership not based on hero heroic individuals, but rather the concept of leadership as representative of the group. Uh, and that the, the leader is a prototype and a representative of the group. And indeed, if the, the group does not uh, see the leader as prototypical of them as a group, representative of them as a group, then there is no followership. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no leader because there is no followership. That heroic individual is a, is a broken model in that sense. I could see this, this notion in, in the way parents were using more Facebook than the looking at SM, MS Teams, for example. They po were following more those kind of media. Definitely, I think one of, the, one of the ideas of leadership in that kind of model is the curation of uh, groups, the curation of identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is a social and group based, group level act and response rather than again, this individual hero type of uh, leadership. So, so bringing together people so that they can be mutually supportive is an act of leadership much more than you know the grand vision that I'm going to bring to you, like some sort of godlike figure or some craziness like that. You know, it's it's this kind of instead curation of of mutuality that, that is kind of implied. Okay. I'm I'm also thinking here that this this somehow relates um, um, the the leadership. Uh, but but also going back to Björn's question about how professionals collectively come to together to deal with the earthquake uh, and 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 this connects again in in my mind somehow with Professor Apple's um, keynote yesterday when he gave this uh, example of two uh, two actors uh, both with agency but uh, departing from ideal ideologically different. Uh, uh, strands or, or roots of, of, of thought, but uh, they were able to come together to solve a, a, a problem, uh, exhibiting that, that agency, setting aside those uh, differences, but in the face of, of, of a mutually experienced uh, issue, they, they were able to, to, to join forces and, and, and uh, and, and deal with that problem. And, and, and that also ties to, to what Nicholas, you were saying about 
in your presentation about and and, and just now about not uh, necessarily reaching the consensus or or that that might not be the 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 aim or it might not be an appropriate uh, aim anymore but rather to think about how how do we stand resilient in 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 the face of 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 these <laughs> earthquakes that 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 we need to deal with and and how to to find the the uh, join the forces and find the agency for for acting upon those uh, uh, challenges. Uh, do do we have other uh, questions? I see that there are again new people people arriving and and some might have been been um, uh, leaving us. So um, do we have other other questions or comments? at this point. I think agency is in the group anyway. That's that's the sort of key message. Yes, and 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 um, identifying the, the the ways in a way to first of all it might be an issue to identify the agency and and then to to harness it for the mutual purpose. Yeah. I gave, um, I'm, well, I'm hogging the space. So I'm only hogging it in case that, you know, while other people perhaps think of questions or whatever, or, or if you, I'm happy to give way. But uh, in another presentation I did um, recently, I, I, I called this the post autonomy era of education. So that rather than thinking of individuals and individual autonomy in this uh, changed landscape, that we might think of this as the post-autonomy era, one in which we realize the mutual dependence and interdependence, uh, rather than organizing education for an individual to be empowered, that we rather think about organizing education based on um, um, post-autonomy, you know, uh, in social empowerment. Thank you. I do not see other hands here at the moment. Um, so um, perhaps we begin then to gradually wrap up the, the session. We only had two papers, but we had a very, very interesting uh, discussion. And thank you to uh, presenters for very interesting and well-prepared uh, papers. So I think this gave a lot of food for thought for, for us and, and for for the TEPE network. Uh, also many things to think about. Um, so uh, rather than maybe trying to, at this point to synthesize uh, uh, a take home message, uh, I maybe just offer some, some thoughts from, from my notebook that I, I scribbled down. Uh, and I might have captured the key points or I might have missed them, but I'll nevertheless offer, offer some thoughts. <laughs> um, so, um, which I think that might have some implications for teacher educators and, and perhaps in the long run also for uh, education policy. And, and the first idea was from, um, from uh, the first paper about school and uh, and being in, being in school and being in class and 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 the shift in in the conceptualization of of, of those towards the more psychological entities and and um, and sort of how uh, that uh, grows in into a mutual experience and 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 somehow 
we're all in this together, but, but we might conceptualize or remember it very differently after time has passed. Nevertheless, it will uh, certainly leave some um, uh, traces in, in uh, how we perceive the world around us and how we act and how we act as teacher educators and how we, we act as and think as, as perhaps future teachers. Um, also the, the uh, uh, point of the gendered aspect, I think came very powerfully uh, across and, and the, the uh, potential inequalities and, and uh, really the depth of experience that uh, individuals uh, can have. And, and really the difficulty also of, of, of capturing all that depth um, and bringing it to attention. And I think that's why research uh, like, like um, the one that has been presented here today is so important uh, because it, it really um, puts, puts the finger on, on those uh, uh, differences and, and inequalities that, that we must not um, uh, close our eyes uh, for. Um, also, uh, the ideas of resilience, agency, leadership, and, and collective problem solving uh, somehow emerge as, as keywords from, from this um, uh, session. Uh, so with those words, I, I um, hope to, to wrap up and, and um, Thank you once again very much to the presenters and, and everybody who participated. And I think it's been a very, very interesting session. And I hope to see you uh, again in, in 50 minutes in the following session. Thank you very much. Thank you.